At the outbreak of the Great War, the German Empire had already given up on creating a surface fleet that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Royal Navy. But Germany did have a global empire that required defense. So while the German ships in the European theater mostly stayed in port and only engaged in combat occasionally, notably the Battle of Jutland, German ships that were already abroad were sent out as commerce raiders to attack Entente shipping. They were far from home, had no support, and almost no chance of a friendly port, and were literally always running the risk of sinking, and so most of them didn't accomplish much. But a few managed to become a legitimate threat to Entente shipping. And among those was SMS Emden, a Dresden-class light cruiser that terrorized and paralyzed Entente shipping in the Indian Ocean for nearly two months in an unlikely 30,000 nautical mile campaign. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Though a latecomer to the European colonial game, Germany had seized a large overseas empire, including part of New Guinea, German Samoa, and several colonies in Africa. At the beginning of the war, Germany had two heavy cruisers, six light cruisers, and four gunboats overseas, protecting German interests. They were immediately at risk, given Britain's advantage at sea, and were given orders across the board to act against the Entente countries. The Emden was laid down in 1906 and launched in 1908. She was armed with 10 10.5cm guns and 5 5.2cm guns, as well as two torpedo tubes. She was christened by the mayor of her namesake, the city of Emden, and in 1910 she was assigned to join the German East Asia Squadron. From 1903, the ship was commanded by Karl von Mueller, and carried a crew of about 400, including one of the Kaiser's nephews. The Emden was stationed with a squadron in Kyushu Bay, leased territory, a port in China that Germany had seized and then leased in 1898 after the murder of several German priests. At the outbreak of war, the Emden was alone at port. On July 31st, only days before war was declared, Mueller had Emden prepared and left port to prepare for commerce raiding. Germany officially declared war on August 2nd, and the following day the Emden captured a Russian steamer, the Ryazan. The ship was known to the Emden crew and had visited the German port. When the German official announced that the steamer was a prize of war, the captain said, I don't know what you're saying. I do not speak German. The official responded, Well, you've forgotten a lot. You knew German well enough a fortnight ago when we were drinking beer together in the club. The ship was then sent back to Germany's Chinese port, where it was converted to an auxiliary cruiser. It was the first ship captured by the Germans in the First World War. And enjoyed the rest of the German East Asian squadron, commanded by Admiral Maximilian von Spee in the Mariana Islands. Von Spee's plan was to cross the Pacific to South America, where they would be able to find coal. Mueller suggested that a single light cruiser be detached to harass Allied shipping in the Indian Ocean. Von Spee authorized the mission, and Mueller was assigned with the Emden to detach from the squadron. Around this time, the fleet also learned that Japan was aligning itself with the Entente and dispatching a fleet to hunt down the whole squadron. The Emden was not entirely alone, as it was accompanied by a coal ship, the Markomania. Mueller ordered his crew to build a fourth dummy smokestack aboard the ship, which would disguise it as a British light cruiser, and specifically imitated the three round funnels and one oval funnel of HMS Yarmouth. By September 5th, Emden had sailed to the Bay of Bengal, where it achieved complete surprise. The British believed that Emden was still with the rest of the Asian squadron. Mueller and his crew captured the Greek SS Pontporos on the 7th, which was carrying 6,500 tons of coal for the British. He took the ship into his service and even agreed to pay the crew. Even better, the captured ship had a newspaper only a few days old, full of reports of merchant ships leaving ports. Now the Emden had targets. On the 10th, the Emden captured the British SS Indus. The German strategy was not to fly a flag, but come in close to the unsuspecting merchantmen until it was too late for them to flee to announce themselves as German. The Indus, assuming that a British cruiser was approaching, sent up her flag in greeting. The Indus was well supplied, chartered by the British government, and ready to carry horses and men to Europe, a proper prize. They took what they could on the sea, put the British crew under guard aboard the Markomania, and sank the ship. On the 11th, the Emden captured the Lovett, another troop ship. The crew was taken and the ship sunk. The English captains let slip that more ships were following these. They captured the Kabinga to use as a junk ship meant to carry captured crews. On the 12th, they sank two more, bringing their total to seven ships captured or sunk. They met an Italian ship later that day. Italy was officially neutral, but had signed the defensive triple alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Emden asked the Italian not to give away their position before they broke off. Two days later, they captured their eighth, and finally piled all the captured crews aboard the Kabinga and sent the ship on its way to release the sailors at the nearest British port. All of this was within the code of gentlemanly conduct, which had been established in previous wars and which Captain Mueller was determined to follow.
Not one soul had been hurt in capturing eight ships as war was generally considered to be a conflict between governments and their property, not the individual sailors. Or at least, that's what Mueller believed. They set charges aboard the eighth ship to sink, but coal aboard ignited, sending the whole ship up with a spectacular blaze while the sun set. The Emden fled the side and spotted another ship. This one fled immediately, but the Emden caught up, identifying the ship as the Clan Matheson. English? asked the Germans. British, the ship replied. The captain was Scottish. The Matheson was full of Rolls Royces, locomotives, and thoroughbred racehorses. The horses couldn't be taken on the Emden, so they were killed before the ship was sunk. The Germans in intercepted a message sent to all steamers. The Italian ship they had met earlier had given away the Emden's position. It hardly mattered, as the junk ship had alerted the Admiralty anyway. The British kept the information quiet, but warships were sent to hunt the Emden down. Ultimately, they had a coal at sea, but found the coal to be of a bad quality that would smoke heavily, giving away the Emden's position. They caught a Norwegian ship next, but Norway was neutral, so they handed over the captured crew of the Matheson and sent them on their way. As they parted, the freed British gave a cheer for the Germans, who had treated them so well. The French and the UK were unwilling to report the full extent of Emden's victories, hoping to prevent panic, so Mueller decided to take an action that couldn't be ignored. He turned his ship towards the Indian city of Madras. Sailing there took four days, and intercepted reports showed newsmen desperately speculating about where the Germans had gone. Several reported that she was already sunk. At Madras, Mueller hoped to target the Burma Oil Company's supplies. As they approached the city on the night of September 22nd, they were surprised to find the city had taken no precautions. All of its lights were on, illuminating the Germans' targets. At 9.45 p.m., the Emden began firing, hitting the fuel tanks and firing into the city. 125 rounds were fired in total. The defenders hardly managed to shoot back. Most of the guns were unmanned as a large party was happening in town, a party being held to celebrate the reported singing of the Emden. Allied ships were all over the ocean now searching for her. The Germans sailed to Ceylon, worried about their smoky coal. Officers aboard joked that they prayed every night for God to send them a British ship loaded with Cardiff's finest coal. At Ceylon, today Sri Lanka, they captured two more ships, including Timerik, which had only stopped at Ceylon hoping to learn where the Emden was. The Germans overheard the captain making plans to sabotage the Tumeric's engines, hoping to delay the Emden. Instead, the captain was arrested and the Tumeric hastily sunk. The Germans did find reports of the damage they had done at Madras, which reported that the principal result of this incident had been to stop the return of confidence of shipping men. For two weeks, no ships left the region's harbor out of fear. On September 26th, the Germans captured their 12th ship, which was brought along as another junk ship. The next day, they finally captured their needed coal from another followed by yet another that reported the British had ordered a complete port embargo in the Indian Ocean while the Emden remained at large. Five ships had been captured or sunk in the last week, and they took a sixth that evening. The crews of all those ships were finally sent off on an overpacked junk ship, which again offered three cheers for the captors as it left for a friendly port. At least 16 ships were after the Emden now, from what they could hear from the wireless. After months at sea, the ship needed maintenance, and so Mueller fled to the Chagos Archipelago, where they spent ten days scraping and painting the rusty hull. On October 15th, they were back at it, capturing another ship. The next day, they found a dredger, which was worth little as a prize, but whose crew was desperate to get off what they termed a coffin. Over the next few days, they captured another four ships. They captured so many so quickly that it took hours to sort out which ones to sink, while one was kept as a coal ship and another set off with the captured sailors. Now Mueller led his ship towards the Malay Peninsula to attack proper warships. Just before 5 a.m. on October 28th, the Emden rushed into Penang Harbor. They fired two torpedoes at a Russian cruiser. The second caused an interior explosion that split the ship in two. They escaped just as quickly and captured another merchantman later that day, but had to abandon it as a French destroyer appeared. In a fierce fight, it too was sunk. Mueller sent boats to pick up the survivors, though many of them fled from the German boats. The Emden fled the area, but found that a destroyer was tracking them, staying just out of range. They lost it in a storm, and then sought a ship to transfer the wounded Frenchmen aboard, which they found on October 30th. Twenty-three merchant ships had been captured by the little cruiser, and two warships sunk. She didn't know it, but at least 78 enemy warships were then searching for her. While culling on the 31st after regrouping with her coal ships, the Emden's first casualty of the war was a torpedo man, whose hip was broken by a dropped 500-pound bag of coal. They next sailed for Direction Island, side of an important telegraph station. A force of men went ashore to find the base undefended. Here the crew learned that they had all been awarded the Iron Cross by the Kaiser. The station was thoroughly destroyed, but what the Germans didn't know is that they had been spotted hours earlier and an SOS already sent out. 
The Germans believed the nearest enemy ship to be 250 miles away, and at 9 a.m. mistook the oncoming Sydney for their coaling ship. The Sydney was an Australian light cruiser, faster and slightly better armed than the Emden. It closed before the Germans could get their steam up. The Germans fired first, and her fourth salvo took out the fire control room. But that was the last good luck Emden would have. The Sydney retreated out of Emden's range and then opened fire with her superior guns. Ten minutes later, shells landed near the bridge. The wireless room was destroyed, and Hitz damaged her steam system. The guns were taken out one by one, and then she lost internal communications. When the Emden finally closed, most of her ammunition carriers were dead, and the remaining guns could fire only intermittently. Mueller ordered his desperately wounded ship to run aground. Once on the reef, the Sydney seized her fire and turned away after her coal ship. The Germans, many wounded, were stranded on the deck without fresh water and menaced by birds. The Sydney returned and opened fire because the Emden's battle flag remained up. Mueller finally pulled it down and put up a flag of surrender. Sydney sent one of the captured small boats from the coal ship and left, heading back to the telegraph station. Finally, the next day, the Sydney returned to retrieve the survivors. 133 crewmen were killed, another 65 injured aboard the Emden. The Sydney had lost only four men, with 17 wounded. In an almost unbelievable adventure, the shore party that had been sent ashore to destroy the telegraph station managed to escape in a stolen schooner and eventually, by way of Yemen, make it all the way back to Germany. While her career during the war was short, the Emden was one of Germany's most successful surface raiders. Most of the rest of the East Asian squadron was destroyed at the Falkland Islands without having done nearly as much damage as the Emden had. And perhaps as impressive was the way that Captain Mueller was described as an honorable man, even in the British press, for the way that he treated prisoners. One of the last of a generation of gentlemen officers that would fade in the brutality of the First World War and the totality of the Second World War. The story of the Emden is really one of military valor in the face of long odds. All alone, the little ship avoided a veritable navy that had been sent after it, struck fear into the hearts of merchant captains, and virtually paralyzed trade in the Indian Ocean, making Mueller perhaps Germany's most successful pirate. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.